Welcome to The Community Table, a discussion series about real life with diabetes. Community Table is presented to you by the JDRF Beyond Type 1 Alliance and made possible with support from Abbott, Lilly, and Dexcom. Hey everyone, I'm Tiana Cooks, Senior Community Manager from Beyond Type 1. For those of you who are new here at Beyond Type 1, it is our mission to go beyond to help people with diabetes stay alive and thrive. Today, we are thrilled to present to you our third community table event in our series of 10 conversations where we bring together diverse voices from the diabetes community and beyond in order to have unfiltered and honest conversations about critical topics and shared experiences lived through diabetes. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Kelvin Davis of Notoriously Dapper. Kelvin is a body positivity advocate, an influencer, an author, and a model. Kelvin lives with type 2 diabetes, and despite his diagnosis, he lives each day in purpose, inspiring everyone worldwide to simply love themselves by finding and embracing their beauty within. He has been featured in impressive list of publications from Cosmopolitan, New York Times, Vice, Huff Post, Glamour, and the Daily Mail for his contributions to the male body positivity movement. Welcome to our community table, Kelvin. We are so lucky to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. That was pretty awesome, you know, made me sound kind of cool. <laughs> you're so impressive. Like, you're really cool. I mean, you've done so many things and have inspired a wave of men and people around the world. So we're just excited that you are joining us today and just looking forward to hearing more about you and your story. Would you mind sharing with us how long you have been living and thriving with diabetes and a bit about the circumstances of your diagnosis? Of course, yeah. So I've been living with type 2 diabetes since uh, early 2021. So about like two years and some change now. Um, And the journey has been a very uh, interesting one, right? Like when I first got diagnosed, it was, you know, one of those things where um, you don't have any information about type 2 diabetes, how it operates in your body, what to do next. You're kind of just handed, you know, the medication and, you know, um, a bag of like strips to prick your finger with. And they pretty much just tell you good, good, good luck with it. Right. So it's like one of those things where yeah. when I first got diagnosed, it was like more of a a mental challenge rather than physical Mm -hmm. because physically I felt fine right because I didn't have any symptoms or any of that sort so mentally it was more of like a struggle trying to pass through and trying to get through it and once I was able to get through it mentally then I was able to be like okay these these are the things that I need to do to try to you know live and thrive with this kind of thing right right and you know I was blessed enough to you know have the opportunity to you know um meet some people that you know uh, gave me some information that uh, a medical professional wasn't able to give me, and I was able to, you know, kind of understand how your glucose level works and how it works with uh, whenever you eat certain foods and, um, you know, just overall how to care for your body mentally and physically. Wow. Yeah. So to even, like, kind of dissect what you just said, when you were first diagnosed, you didn't have any resources or information about how to manage type 2 diabetes. So you're basically like on your own and yeah. you're living with this whole diagnosis. So how did you end up meeting um, the individual and like where were you at when you met them? Yeah. So, I, you know, I believe in like good karma and I believe that if you are good to people, you know, it's karma circles around because yeah. like people always talk about karma being bad, right? It's like if you have bad, if you do bad things, the bad karma comes around. But nobody ever talks about the good karma that comes around when you do good by people. And um, my youngest daughter at the time was a part of like this youth soccer club. Mm-hmm. And they were doing uh, like one of their last practices of the season. And normally uh, whenever I take them, you know, I normally don't stay. I normally, like, go run some errands or do something else and come back. But on this day, you know, I stood around and talked to some of the other parents and stuff. And I was talking to one of the dads. And I was telling him, you know, I'm having a real hard time. I just got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And fortunately for me, there was a mother there that was on 
the who who had a kid on the same team, and she was a diabetes education specialist. That was her job. Wow. And she came up to me and was like, hey, I don't mean to interrupt, but my name is Casey, and I am a um, I am a certified diabetes education specialist. I've run this class every day, but it's open on every it's open on every third Wednesday to the public. Otherwise, you have to have like a prescription to go to it. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So she was like, "It's open <clears throat> on the third Friday of every month." So she was like, "On this Wednesday coming up is is this third Wednesday? It's open to the public. You're more than welcome to come. It's about a four to five hour class. I give a rundown about how to manage your type two diabetes or type one." And, you know, we go over foods, we go over all these different things, medicines, how your body works internally to process sugar, all this stuff. So I go to it and it completely changed the way that I look at my type 2 diabetes because I was like, no longer, this isn't a death sentence anymore. This Mm -hmm. is something that's livable. This is something that I can thrive with. And this is something that now I have the confidence in that I can do it on my own. Right. Yeah, that is such an just a a story to tell because I feel like a if you hadn't been in that exact spot at that exact day, like who knows if you would have met her or if you know exactly. the stars would align like you said. Like um, you believe in putting good energy out, and then it comes right back. And I guess that is a, a great example of just how the universe kind of aligns. But more importantly, I'm just glad that you were able to receive the information that you probably should have received on day one when you were first diagnosed. Right. Yeah, yeah, like that's just, that's like, there's a huge gap in our medical like system and the way that people are, you know, being diagnosed with type two diabetes, um, yeah. diabetes in general. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And are you the only person in your family with type with diabetes at all? Or I am that. So I have a father that has type one, Okay. And then I've had family members that have type two. Unfortunately, um, they ended up passing from complications of type two. But uh, right now, uh, my dad and myself are the only two living ones with diabetes in our family. Um, my dad's had type one since he was like about, I think, like seven or eight. He's almost 60 now. So he's been, you know, dealing with it for a long time. And even as a kid, I remember you know, him, like, doing his, like, insulin shots with, like, the syringe, like, in his stomach and taking his blood sugar, all that stuff. So, for me, um, I've been so used to him, like, because ever since I've been born, I've been, like, watching right. him do this, right? It's nothing foreign to to me. So, you know, see, seeing him live and thrive and be able to live, to, you know, this wonderful life with right. type 1, I was like, you know, when I got type 2, I felt like a little bit of hope, but then I started to remember that, um, well, not really remember, but I started to think that type one is the diabetes that has the most amount of um, medical, like, help, I feel yeah. like. And right. type two, they just pretty much are like, oh, uh, well, you'll be all right. Here's the medicine. Here's all, all, all this kind of stuff. I feel like when you are diagnosed with type one, there's a little bit more of a seriousness that goes along with it when it comes to certain medical professionals. And I think that's really sad because it's like, you know, whether you're type one or type two, you should be provided both with the same amount of information as a type one person Mm -hmm. does. And I know, you know, the big difference is that a type one person needs insulin and type two doesn't, but there are some insulin dependent type twos, right? right? And it's just like, you know, they can have the ability to get that same information that a person with type one has. So they right. can not only, you know, do the right things, but they can feel confident in themselves that they are doing the right thing for their body. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's a great, uh, you know, you have such a test from your dad having type one to you later on, um, you know, being diagnosed with type two and you're right. So you've seen both ends of the spectrum in terms of, you know, how medical professionals handle each diagnosis. And like you said, like the seriousness of how they, you know, type one versus the type two. And that's not okay. You're, I mean, across the board, everyone should have equal access to care. 
to technology, to all of the information and the resources. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Of course, yeah. And, you know, with my dad having type 1, we go to the same doctor, right? Yeah. So when I went in for my quarterly checkup, you know, and my dad's quarterly checkup was like two days prior. Mm -hmm. So when I went to my doctor and got my stuff done, you know, when I went back to go, uh, when I went back to go, um, get like my results and stuff. Uh, he was like, you know, your A1C is 12.6, but he thought that he got my blood valves confused with my dad's because me and my dad have the same name, like the exact same name. So the nurse uh, thought she made a mistake because she was like, you know, his dad has type one. And if his dad's, you know, is 12.6, that would make more sense than him because I mean, he doesn't seem, you know what I mean? Like, they thought I was, you know, like, I wasn't having any symptoms. And they were asking me, like, do you have any frequent urination? I was like, no, I'm good. Right. You know what I mean? So, um, he was like, okay, I'm going to run your blood work again. I'm going to have you fast. Come in tomorrow, and we're going to do your blood work again because we just, you know, we just want to make sure that we have the right blood work. So, I did it, and, you know, they didn't make a mistake. It was the right blood work, and it was my A1C. It was 12.6, which is... For me, I, at that time, I didn't know what that meant. You know, I was like, oh, well, that's not that bad. He was like, that's really bad, actually. That means you have type 2 diabetes. Like, your A1C is supposed to be anywhere in between 4.5 to 5.6. Like, it is not yeah. supposed to be anywhere over that. And he was telling yeah. me that, like, in, like, the sevens, it's, like, pre-diabetic. He was like, anything over that, you're in trouble, mm-hmm. right? So when he gave me the information, I'm like, so 12.6 is really bad. And he said, I, he looked at me and he said, I don't know how you're not in a diabetic coma. Wow. You didn't have any signs or like regular nothing. symptoms. Like they always say like thirst, frequent exactly. urination, yeah. like fatigue. And you had none of those. I had none of those, which was weird to me. Cause it's like, after, you know, after I found out, I started to think back, like, was I ever tired? Was I yeah. like, was I urinating a lot? Was I ever thirsty? And I really can't think about a time that I was. Wow. And that was the scariest part. It's like, it was almost like a silent killer. It's like, sometimes you might not have the stereotypical, you know, um, signs and symptoms. Right. And it's very important for men, especially men of color, to go get checked, to go right. get checkups, mm-hmm. to go to the doctor, to get things done because you could be sleeping with something that you don't even know. Mm. That is so powerful, and you're absolutely right. People of color, men of color, everybody who, you're right, like might have something and just doesn't know because they don't go in for those annual checkups um, like like you did. And thank you for for advocating for that too because that's very important. Of course. Um, And like you said, like a lot of times living with diabetes is a daily challenge that only those of us that have it can like truly, truly understand. Um, But what are some ways that you've had to adjust your lifestyle to support, you know, your diabetes management? Of course. Um, Let me see. I definitely have to, had had to change the way that I eat, the way that I view food. So my Mm. relationship with food changed a lot because Mm. I was no longer eating just for taste and just to eat. I was eating to fuel my body and I was eating to really make sure that my glucose levels were at a reasonable level. Right. So I had to change that mental part of food and the consumption of it. So, you know, whereas late at night when I would like snack on certain things and stuff, I would have to stop doing that. You know, like if I wanted something at night, I would have like a few pretzels or I would have like some peanuts or like a little bit of yogurt, but I wouldn't eat like a half a bag of chips or, you know what I'm saying? Like I wouldn't eat these things that, you know, that would normally cause my blood sugar levels to spike. And, um, you know, with your whole relationship with food, whenever that changes, it takes a while for you to get used to it. Yeah. But once you, but once you get used to it, you're like, okay, this isn't that bad. It really isn't. Because people, right. I mean, people, I mean, people like to make a big deal. It's like, I just, uh, I just can't live without this. I'm like, yes, you can. You can live <laughs> without it. Because if you don't, you might not be living at all. Right. You you know what I mean? That's so the point. it's like, yeah. So it's like, you have a choice, you know? And it's like, for me, you know, that's the way I look at it. I'm like, I can, you know, not listen to my body 
and not mm-hmm. listen to the things that I've learned and go the opposite way and end up suffering the consequences yep. that, you know, other family members that I've had had to suffer. They got their legs amputated. They went mm-hmm. blind. They ended up passing away. Like, I don't want any of that to happen to me. Right. right. So changing your diet and understanding that these that these foods are meant to nourish your body. Right. And I feel like that relationship with food like just needs to change in the world, especially especially in America, where it's like a lot of kids from birth right. really are like just taught just to eat, like just to eat. Like they're not taught to eat like when they're hungry or like to eat like a nutritious meal. I mean right. even I mean, even in some public schools, like you look at some of the meals and you're like that's not nutritious. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, you, what are you putting in, in your body? Yeah, right? Yeah. So, you know, along with that and, you know, the mental part of it is, um, you know, I like exercise a lot and I'll mm-hmm. meditate. So whatever, you know, I feel like a little bit of mental stress because stress and lack of sleep can cause your cortisol level to spike, which right. can cause your which could cause your blood sugar levels to spike too. So it's really important to have like a good sleeping regimen Mm. and to have as much less stress as you can. You know, it's very, it's very hard and it's inevitable to have stress because people are going to have stress whether, you know, you want it or not. Right. Right. That's like, that's just the way of life, but you have to find a way to deal with it in a way that, you know, it doesn't spike your cortisol to go all the way up to like your blood sugar levels, right? right. Like you can't sit sit there and dwell on something. You have to move your body, go outside, go listen to some music, meditate, exercise, do something to get your mind off of it. Because right. at the end of this day, I mean, there's been times where I haven't eaten and, you know, I'm not hungry, right? And then I'll check my blood sugar levels and it'll be like in like the 200s. And it's because I'm stressed. Yeah. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like, I'm like, I'm like literally like in the 250s and it's simply because I'm like worried about A, B, and C. Like, I need to, I I need to get up, move, go on a walk, you know, go do something to ease my mind. Right. Yeah. No, those are all key factors. And, and I think even people that don't live with diabetes should also consider, you know, how does, yeah, like how does their physical activity match up with their, their you know, diet and what they're consuming each day. And then the sleep, that's a big component of this whole thing. Yes. People don't realize how big sleep is and it really does impact, you know, your cognitive thinking, exactly. your physical functionality, like every aspect of your life. So that's big. And yeah. then your blood sugars, like you've seen it too. Everything that we do impacts our, our blood sugar in some way, shape or form. Yeah, it um, does. I mean, it's like the same way where like people talk about like blood, they talk about blood pressure, like blood pressure works the same way. If you're stressed yeah. out, your blood pressure is high. Right. If you eat too much salt, your blood pressure is high. Like you got to bring that stuff. Like everything is related to like your surroundings, your energy, your inter energy yep. and your like external energy, like mm. what you put in your body and what you allow outside of your body. Right. Affects your day to day, every day. If you eat like crap, I don't know if, if I'm allowed to curse or not. <laughs> and, and, am I a lot of curse? No, okay, okay. Free All right. rain, free rain. Uh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so, you know, if you eat like shit and like you, you know, like, you know, surround yourself with people that have bad intentions, granted, you're probably not going right. to have the best day to day. You know, exactly. it's, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's true. And I wanted to ask you a question kind of based on just what we were just talking about. Like, I think living with diabetes does bring certain feelings of fear and vulnerability. And um, I'm sure you've had to overcome multiple different fears, maybe not even fears, just challenges um, after being diagnosed. So my question is like, how have you been able to navigate during those difficult times? Like you said, you meditate. Yeah, Has that been like the biggest help for you or? Uh, yeah, that and honestly surrounding myself with like positive people to people. And, you know, so and being in close contact with people that mean well and that love to see you uh, thrive no matter what's going on in your life, because fear is a big aspect of it. Right. And one of my biggest fears was that I was going to end up like my aunt or end up like my uncle or end up like, you know, these people that, you know, I saw 
it detriment. I mean, I would see them. I slowly saw them like, you know, suffer. You know what I mean? Like I would see them on one Christmas and, you know, things would be fine. And then the next time I would see them, their leg would be gone. The next time I would see them, they'd be blind. The next time I see them, they were like in a casket. You know what I'm saying? So for me, it was like, that was the fear for me was that. And, you know, that's a big fear for anybody that has diabetes because once, because once you reach those levels, it's like, there's no turning back. Like when you have to get your leg amputated, there's no, I mean, you have to, I mean, it's, it's game time. You know what I mean? So that was a huge fear. And you know, me overcoming that fear was knowing that I have the tools and the confidence that the diabetes education class gave me. And I have, you know, obviously, you know, a uh, medical professional that, you know, gives me, you know, sound advice about, you know, how to, um, you know, um, try different foods or like when to try different foods, you know, um, you know, he always tells me, you know, if you're like, if your sugar is around like the 100 to one to 150 range, it's okay for you to go ahead and, you know, try like something new that could or could not spike your blood sugar levels. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, that's really how I deal with the fear, you know? It's all about having faith and having that kind of hope that everything will be fine because you have the knowledge and you have the tools to do better. Seeing your family members and people that you love really struggle with their diabetes is all too too much of a reality for so many people, um, yeah. especially those that don't get the proper resources or access to, you know, a diabetes educator. Um, and I think that the issues kind of start at, right, like at the doctor's office. We need to address how people can be diagnosed for success, right? Of course, yeah. So yeah. that's a huge component. And um, man, you've really taken your diabetes and you've shown diabetes like who's boss, I guess, right? Like you. Yeah, of course. I'm like, you're not going to run my life. I'm going to run you. You know what I mean? Exactly. And that's the model that I use because I was like, I don't want this to be a dictation of mm -hmm. my life. You, right. you, you know what I mean? I want to live my life. Right. And it's just a part of me, you know? But yeah. it isn't me. Ooh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So strong. That's so powerful. It's a part of you, it's not you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to also hear that you've been able to overcome that fear um, because a lot of people just live in fear, especially after finding out that they have a diagnosis like diabetes. Yeah. And it's, it's a challenge mentally to, you know, finally overcome. And people still live with, like, fear of hypoglycemia or fear of yeah. – there's just so many things that come with it, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, like, we all have those fears. Like, you know, there's still sometimes I have fears of when I go to restaurants. And I'm very particular about this because it's like I – because this happened to me when I, whenever I went to Sonic. And thankfully, I had, like, a, a CGM on. So I was able to recognize my blood sugar whenever it started yeah. to spike. But I went to Sonic and, you know, I asked for a diet cherry limeade, mm -hmm. right? But unfortunately – the person made me a regular cherry limeade. Oh, no. And I couldn't really taste the difference. I can only taste the difference in between, like, Diet Coke and regular Coke and Diet Dr. Pepper and, like, regular Dr. Pepper. Yeah. I can't really taste the difference between, like, the Coke Zeros and, like, you know, like, the fruity kind of drinks. I, right. I don't, I can't really tell, right? So I, I was thinking, it, thinking that it was, like, a Diet, you know, cherry limeade, like I asked for. And all of a sudden, for me, you know, having it now... I can feel in my body when my blood sugar starts to spike. Like, I'll yeah. get, like, a, a little bit of a headache. Mm -hmm. And, like, my lips will feel a little heavy. Yep. And, you know, like, my vision, it won't get blurred, but it will, like, be just, like, a little bit more difficult to, like, focus, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when that started to happen, I said, oh, my, my blood sugar is getting really high. Like, it's high, high. So I, like, checked it, and it was, like, damn near, like, 290. Oh, my goodness. I was like, whoa, hold up. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like there's so like there's that fear, too, of like right. hoping to trust other people mm -hmm. with like what you order. Because, you know, some people just sometimes think you're ordering diet because like you just don't want the sugar because you want to be like a little 
like skinny mini. I'm like, I don't care about being skinny. I want to be healthy. You know right. what I mean? But right. it's like, sometimes they don't take it as serious. It's like, yeah. and you, and you know, like you don't want to yeah. vocalize to every wait staff or every person that serves you food. I have diabetes. So make sure right. you bring me diet and Coke and not regular Coke. But right. sometimes you have to, because they might mess up. You have to advocate for yourself in all facets of I, of life, right? Like yeah. whether you're at the doctor's office, at a restaurant, at a school, at work, yeah. right? You have to tell your the people, those around you, yeah. um, what's going on. And you're right. Like at restaurants, I feel sometimes there is a little bit of like more of a stigma when you tell people. And of course, just like, you know, trying yeah. to avoid that, but it's important. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and, and it's like if, if they took it as serious as they took allergies, you right. know, people wouldn't have a problem. Right. Because it's like you take seafood allergies very seriously. You take, you know, this allergy, very like a peanut allergy, very serious, but like you don't take diabetes serious. Yeah. Like you could give yeah. me something that could send me into like diabetic shock. Right. And I think that's like leading into my next question around like stigma. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've grown up with your dad having type one diabetes. So you like, were you conscious of any stigmas around diabetes or that individuals with diabetes face? Yeah. Um, I really wasn't uh, familiar with any. Sti- I was more familiar with the stigmas of type two. Mm, if that yeah. makes sense. I was yeah. I was really um, under the impression that type one wasn't. uh if like if you had diabetes, type one mm-hmm. was the one to have. Right. That was my stig- stigma in my head, just based off of the societal perception that I received from the way people would say things or interact. You, right. you, you know what I mean? Um, and you know, I the stigma with type two was for me was that you know you did it you did it to yourself, right? Mm-hmm. If you're overweight or if you ate like crap or if you didn't take good yeah. care of yourself. Yeah. You did it to yourself, so nobody should feel bad for you. Right. You you know what I mean? Right. Whereas, like, type one, it's like you're born with it or, you know, it's hereditary. You really can't help it. People are like, you know? So that was a stigma for me was that, like, one of them people, like, were empathetic and, you know, um, caring about. The other one, people were like, well, you shouldn't have been eating, eating all those damn cheeseburgers and chips and cakes and yeah. all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so. this, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the stigma has no actual, like, real, like, validity behind it, right? Not at all. A lot of people assume that people have just decided to wake up and give themselves diabetes. Yeah. So today sounds like a good day to get diagnosed when that's not the case at all, yeah. right? And it's very unfortunate because they don't realize that this could be anybody. Exactly. You know, you're one choice, one day, you know, like it could be anybody. And I hope that it's not, but yeah. it's the reality of it. it and, is. um, you know, even when you talked about knowing the stigmas around type two diabetes and even living with a dad with type one and still not really seeing that side of things, because culturally, I think we've created this narrative around type two that is ultimately harmful and detrimental to people that get diagnosed with the disease in so many for sure. ways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. And thank yeah. you for talking about that. Um, in that same vein, like, has it been hard for you to come out publicly because of the stigma Ooh. and like disclose that you've got type two? Yeah, I, honestly, it was one of the, it was one of the most difficult things that I had to do other than, you know, mentally overcoming the fact that, you know, this was my new life because, you know, I knew eventually I would have to, I would have to tell my audience because it's like when you have a following like that and it's like, if you only share your rainbows and butterflies, you know, you're not being truly authentic to who you are, you Mm -hmm. know? And Mm -hmm. it's like, you have to show those moments of despair, those men, those moments of, you know, uh, of like, you know, mental, uh, challenge, right? Like you have to show those things. Right. You have to. If you don't, you know, you're really just showing the world that you, you quote unquote, live this fairy tale, perfect Instagram mm-hmm. life or what they, you mm-hmm. know, say. So it's like for me, I had a duty to show people, yes, I am happy. Yes, I dress right. well. Yes, I am this dapper guy. Yes, I have a positive attitude. But right now I'm suffering. And this is why. Right. And when I, you know, unbeknownst to me, when I 
you know, release the information to the public, I thought I was going to, I mean, I really wasn't, I was ready to take the heat. Like people be like, you know, body positivity is nothing but a way to promote obesity. And that's why you have type two diabetes. Blah, blah, blah. Right. But I had so many people that follow me that live with type two diabetes as well. Mm-hmm. that I just didn't know. Mm-hmm. Because it's not yep. really a conversation that they're going to comment on if, you know, unless I bring it to the table. So when, right. so whenever I opened the conversation, you know, I got a lot of comments and DMs about people that were like, dude, seeing you say this, like, makes everything so much better. I've been living with type 2 diabetes for five years. I've been living with type 2 diabetes for six months or this and that. And it's like, I just built, like, this little community of, like, people that are like, yo, if this guy can live his best life, model for Target, do all these things and, you know, raise his children right and, you know, be positive on the gram and, you know, and still have this illness yeah, and still have this going on, you know, I could do it too. Absolutely. That's yeah. so, so good. And, um, you know, just being vulnerable and sharing both sides of your story, right? Like, yeah. you know, life isn't always cupcakes and rainbows, like you said. Exactly. Yeah. But man, could you imagine how many people's lives you've changed or you've inspired by sharing your journey, especially those of color and those that don't necessarily see themselves always reflected in in the media or on bigger screens like you of course you know and i hear this quote all the time like um people say like if you've impacted just one life then you know you've you've accomplished a mission so i do wow. think that you sharing your story and find other people finding themselves in your struggle or even in your glory like yeah. I, I think that's very strong so um and in that like, I know, too, we mentioned this at the beginning, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about Notoriously Dapper blog yeah. and your NAACP award nominated book? Of course. Yeah. So um, so I started the blog in 2012. The mm-hmm. blog was created after I had a bad shopping experience. I was, uh, you know, shopping for some newer clothes. I had just gotten my first teaching job after graduating from college and um I was told by a sales associate that I was like too fat to shop there because I couldn't find anything to fit me. Mm. And, uh, you know, and this one particular thing was like, hey, was this bright red blazer that I wanted? And I asked her if they had a larger size in it. And, you know, she was like, no, you know, like maybe you're just too big to shop here. I was like, oh, damn. okay." And it was my first time really as a guy being like publicly body shamed. Yeah. You know, as guys, like, you know, we'll tease each other, you know, like, in, in like, our little men groups and stuff. Right. But, like, you know, being publicly, you know, body shamed in front of a group of strangers right. at, like, a mall is not the best, you know, most, you know, uplifting thing that can happen to someone. Right. You know, um, no matter if you're a man or a woman, kid or adult, right? So, um, you know, it was embarrassing. It was humiliating. It was, like, you know, a, a whole bunch of different levels of uh, negative emotions for myself um and i started to feel really insecure about how i looked at that point and i wanted to create a space where not only i showed that i could have a good fashion sense yeah. but i could also have like a message of you know body about positive body image and how men of all shapes and sizes deserve to feel confident in themselves mm-hmm. and you know i just started you know posting different outfits that i would wear with you know um, you know, with like a paragraph or two with like some uplifting words, you know, add like a couple links here and there to where people can shop the look. And it kind of just blew up um, around. Well, it didn't it didn't just blow up. OK. <laughs> and about 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 like four years later, um, whenever the body positivity movement picked, picked up for women, mm-hmm. people started to get curious if it existed for men. So whenever mm-hmm. people would Google male body positive positivity, I was like the first thing that would come up because I was the only male body positive blog. Wow. So anytime anybody Google like male body positivity or like positive male body image, it would be like notorciedapper.com, notorciedapper.com, yeah. this, that, right? So just based off of public curiosity, I became like this online entity for this knowledge about male body positivity. Yeah. And I was kind of given you know, um, this cape of, like, you know, honor by, like, 
the public to say yeah. like, well, you're the guy that's going to be the face of male body, po- male body positivity. So here you go. And, you know, ever since then, you know, things have really been, you know, just going well for, for the whole platform that I've built. And then I got uh, an offer to write a book and um, the publishing company wanted a book that was an etiquette book, but they were like, you know, and they were very upfront with me. They said, there's a lot of etiquette books that are written by old white guys and they just don't know what they're talking about. We need a etiquette book that's written by not only a young person, but a person of color like yourself. And we need you to give real life sound advice to the men of this generation about how to be mm-hmm. a gentleman. And I was like, you know what? I could do that. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can do that. <laughs> You know what I mean? So at first, honestly, I was like a very um, skeptical about doing it because I was like, you know, I was teaching at the time still. I was like a yeah. full time teacher. I was a full time. I, I was a, a football coach as mm-hmm. well. I was a father of two. I was a husband at the time. And, you know, I all these times I had all these different duties. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I don't want to I don't want to stretch myself thin. So whenever I told them that, they were like, well, you know, if you decide not to do it, we just want you to understand that if you don't do it, then who else will? Right. And I said, right. damn, they know what they're doing. They really got me. <laughs> they really got me. You that's, know, a you heavy, know I mean? that's a heavy weight to carry, though. Like, yeah. Yeah, I could see yeah. where you were a little hesitant. But, man, can you just, you know, like, that just goes to show, like, through this whole journey, like, people see you. And yeah. people are very just eager to be a part of your movement. And um, you're right, like people of color, just seeing themselves and having resources and people that look like them is just so key to yeah. like this movement of also just being more inclusive, right? Of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100. Yeah. Because like, when I mean, even when I think back when I was a kid, like, I mean... <sighs> If I didn't have my dad and my uncles, like, I don't know. I mean, there wasn't much positive representation of black men for me growing up when I was like in right. the, in like the nineties, you, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, right. I was born in 87 and being in the nineties, I, I mean, I, I honestly can't remember. I, I like the more Denzel Washington or something, but, but I mean, even then it's like, you know, you can look up to celebrities and all these people you want to, but you know, what really impacts you is the people that yeah. are around you every day. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. And and that that's also important when we talk about the diabetes community, like finding those people in the community that you can relate to, that you can yeah. reach out to, that inspire you, that uplift you. Like that's important too, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and have you found allyship to be a critical part in your journey or Yes, I have. And you know, I have this friend named uh, Elise, I don't know how to say her last name because it's like Italian. It's like uh, that's so, I, I don't know because I don't want but, to but to butcher it. But her name on Instagram is Ready to Stare, and yeah. she is uh, she is the one that you know because I've been I've been I've been uh, friends with her for a long time, and like because we're like in the same body positive space, right? Yeah. So even before I was diagnosed with type type two diabetes. You know, I always knew she had it and how she lived her life and how positive she was and how she would show herself traveling with all these colorful outfits and showing her CGM, all these things. So for me, you know, having that allyship of, you know, her and, you know, being a part of the community that, you know, she has had the blessing to build and her like inviting me to be a part of this community has yeah. really changed a lot because, you know, you know, whenever, you know, I mean, just like I can relate to whenever one of our, uh, with one of our people in our ally friend group posts on their stories about how did their blood sugar get so high when they only ate this and they like have like a screenshot of like their CDM and how high it is. Like I can relate, like I can relate about the, the like, the like nervousness or like the confusion about like what did I just eat and how did it like spike my blood sugar so high you, you, right. you, you know so it's really awesome to have a good allyship and a good friend group 
of other people mm-hmm. that actually have the same um, illness because it's like, right. you know, when you have people that don't have it, yeah, I mean, like, they can understand it, they can be empathetic, but it's like, when you have somebody that has the same struggles as you day to day. It's different. It's very different. It's different. And yeah. we all need those close circles. I completely agree. Yes. Um, Kelvin, I have just so enjoyed talking to you today. I have one more question for you before we head out. Of course. Um, so, you know, through this whole conversation, I just want to say, like, you are the embodiment of what we mean at Beyond Type 1 and Beyond Type 2 when we say that there is a path that you, you, where you can not only live beyond your diagnosis, but where you can also survive and thrive. Yeah. So as we close out this interview today, um, can you share any words of advice that you might have for anybody who's recently gotten diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Of course, yeah. Oh, man. I would say, you know, I'm a... I'm going to go with what my dad told me whenever, uh, you know, because when my dad got first diagnosed, he was like um, adolescence, like seven, eight. And when I got diagnosed, you know, I was like in my 30s. So when I came to him, and was upset about it. You know, um, what he said to me, which he used to always say this to me whenever I was in high school and stuff. But uh, he said it to me the first time as as an adult during this time. And he says, Remember, don't be the man that finds four quarters and complains it wasn't a dollar bill. And, you know, as like, you know, as I was in like high school stuff, I never understood what he meant. But it was his way of saying, don't complain about circumstances that you really can't change. Because four quarters is still a dollar. You can't change the amount of it. Right. So he said, don't be that person that finds four quarters and then complains that it's that is not a dollar bill. So my dad was like, don't complain that, you know, you have, you know, type two diabetes and that, you know, you wish you had this and that, but you need to be thankful that not only are you here still, but you have the resources to, you know, make it better. And you have a platform to help other people be educated about it. And he was like, and you have me, I've been thriving, son. I was like, yeah. I was like, you're right, dad, you, you know, so, you know, I do live with that model where it's like, you know, as bad as it may seem whenever you first get that information, understanding that like you're still living, you're still going and each day you have an opportunity to make what you have better because you can't change the circumstance. It's already done. So they've given it to you. So you have to move forward. Uh, I can see why a lot of people gravitate towards you, why so many people are inspired by you, and why the world has just kind of got their eyes on you. Kelvin, you are just the embodiment of positivity, but also just you're just so genuine and Thank you bring you. such a, a just warm and inviting spirit to you that a lot of people can definitely gravitate towards. Um, so thank you for allowing us to receive some of that good energy. <laughs> Thank you so and, much. Um, for joining us today. Of course. Last, like, where can where can people find you if they watch this video on social or elsewhere? Yeah, so they can find me on Instagram at Kelvin Davis, all one word, and then NotoriouslyDapper.com, and on Facebook, um, Notoriously Dapper. Okay, you yeah. guys will be there. Notoriously Dapper. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you again. Um, And thank you to everybody who's watched our conversation today. We encourage each of you to join us as we continue amazing conversations in our Beyond Type 2 app. Join our community of allies, mentors, and friends impacted by type 2 diabetes. The app is a wonderful place to stay connected with others, share your story, and find resources and support not only yourself, but others living with type 2 and thriving with it. So, Kelvin, thank you so much. We look forward to talking to you again. Yes. Until then, we'll all try to keep it dapper. Strong. (laughs) Thank you for having me. (laughs) Thanks for listening to this episode of The Community Table, presented to you by the JDRF Beyond Type 1 Alliance and made possible with support from Abbott, Lilly, and Dexcom.